Hello, my name is Matthias, and welcome to the Game Week 14 edition of the FPL Scope Podcast. I am, yeah, like I said, I'm your host, Matthias, and uh, with me today I have my co-host, Kevin, who is in a, a jolly mood, it seems like. Uh, seems pretty happy. Uh, how's life, Kevin? How are you doing? And uh, how do you feel about uh, Game Week 14 and beyond in FPL? Yeah, disappointed uh, with the weekend result against Man United, but at the same time, uh, in normal circumstances, I would have been perfectly fine with losing that game. But considering the fact that we were given the 10-point deduction, every game counts. So frustrating to lose in such a manner, considering the fact that we had several chances to get back into the game, but couldn't finish our dinner. We seem to be doing this at Goodison Park where we can't score or win at home, but we still create a lot of chances and stuff like that. So it's frustrating. And I completely understand fans who go to the games and stuff like that must be heartbreaking for them to have to deal with this shit week in, week out. But regardless, in good spirits, Barcelona went through in the Champions League. Um, You know, it's always fun with the Champions League week compared to the international break. So lots to be happy about, I guess. Fair enough. Uh, I think Everton just like reminded me of the Everton that we saw at the start of the season, just creating a bunch of chances, missing them, and then just conceding some fantastic goals. Uh, we should speak about the Granacha goal in general now that we're of on course. the subject. Like goal of the season, surely, but like in terms of like all time, like how do you rank it in terms of uh, bicycle kicks or just goals in general when it comes to the Premier League era, at least? Top three, top one, even. Like I think yeah. it's pro- possibly the best <laughs> bicycle kick I've seen in. In the prem, yeah. let alone like bicycle kicks, full stop. I mean, I'll always take Ronaldinho's bicycle kick against Villarreal because that's <laughs> you know that's the st- stuff of legends. Um, but you know, uh, it was more clean than Rooney's, um, and I also feel that just generally speaking, it was just a crazy, crazy. <laughs> it's just absolutely crazy goal. Like when I saw that, I was just like, you know what? I can't even hate. And I hate yeah. Garnacho because I think he's a little bitch. But um, <laughs> he did the Cristiano but, celebration as well afterwards. Yeah, yeah. I was not a fan of that. And yeah. also, I don't, I don't like the fact that he uh, kept doing Pedri's binocular uh, celebration after uh, a Pedri got injured, and then obviously when they knocked us out of their Europa League so I was going to have a little bit of resentment towards uh, towards Garnaccio but you know fair enough what a goal yeah but Garnaccio in his own right now he's playing like pretty much every game week now for Man United he's only 4.7 is he someone that you would consider in FL in general if I see that he's getting consistent play then definitely I think yeah. uh, scored again I now think in the Champions like, League as well yeah 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 like I think he's proving that uh which is kind of a messed up thing to say, but yeah, I mean, if Sancho sort of leaves the club, it's sort of like whatever at this point, which makes no sense because I still think Sancho has all the talent and ability in the world to be a world beater and is a world beater. But unfortunately, Ten Hag seems to be just pissing everyone off because now Varane is considering leaving the club. And obviously, I still rate him as one of you know, one of football's best center backs in the world and all this stuff. Yes, he's towards the older side of things, but still more than capable and should be starting for Manchester United, who desperately need him because they're just conceding yeah. goals for fun. Yeah. So that being said, um yeah, if he can if he can sort of get into the starting eleven and is there week in, week out, absolutely. Especially in terms of stashing someone. I think he, you know, like in a doing a range of should I start him in an easier game? Should I bench him in the harder games? Yeah, hundred percent. I think Garnacho is someone to consider. I mean, people were making this debate over uh, Cole Palmer, and now everyone has him, sort of thing. So, yeah, yeah I think Garnacho is someone that people <laughs> should keep an eye out for, especially if he gets consistent play. Yeah. Also depends on Man United how they look because they've been like the forum team of the Premier League, but uh, it's not been that convincing in terms of how they actually played. Uh, even though they beat Everton three 0 it was sort of like a very flattering result still. Even though they scored oh, yeah. a couple of nice goals, but yeah, so it depends to be it remains to be seen what happens with Man United going forward. But either way, let's take a look at what happened in FPL for 
all of us in well not me because i'm gonna have, have my own video on that but for you first you're giving 13 score you got 50 points minus four because you did two transfers and uh, the transfers is probably like the the worst part about your game week because you you really wanted to get um Mbwem win uh, and uh, to do that you had to downgrade gordon to palmer basically and palmer also like in his own right you predicted a, a chelsea we're going to get to that as well you predicted a chelsea winning against newcastle but it did not end up happening it ended up being a 4-1 newcastle win so that was basically like the the thing that went wrong there but looking back at the game week how do you feel about the game week anything you wish you had done differently in terms of the transfers and stuff like with hindsight what would you have done you think i mean Anthony Gordon, generally speaking, has a good record against Chelsea, and I knew that selling him, so I thought the most he'd do is either get an assist or a goal. Then when he got both, I was just like, oh, kill me. <laughs> um, so, I, but for me, it was more about getting rid of Anthony Gordon long term, simply because I like the prospect of Embremo, who should have scored against Arsenal and came close and had several chances, but long term, I think fixture-wise, Embremo looks better. I think... Um, also, Palmer with the Pens and Chelsea having decent fixtures as well. I felt like it didn't feel like such a sideways move. I could have maybe waited a week, sure, yeah. and then just done the transfer for free. But the issue then becomes what the issue is now, which is that Isak is back. And I really like the prospect of Isak. And if I were to bring Isak in, that would require me to do other changes, and then I wouldn't have been able to bring in a boom one, this and that. So yeah. it sort of, it sort of just becomes a, a long, you know, game of chess in that regards. That I'm going to constantly be be having to do these transfers and etc. So yes, sure, I lost out on 13 points, but I think long term wise, I'm not considering getting rid of Palmer and Bueno in the next couple of weeks. So it's fine. Yeah. I'll take it in that regards but uh it does also give me now the freedom to potentially get rid of Watkins or Alvarez if that's what I end up doing but at this rate I'm gonna just hold my breath and see what what I end up doing because I feel like there's still things that I want to change in my team I, I see Gusto and T Tavares in my team and yeah. it pisses me off <laughs> uh so I'm very much looking forward to using the wild card uh next uh next year in that regard <laughs> yeah uh, and i think also over the long term i think palmer and Boemo will be much better than gordon and emitma um personally as well yeah. and also like it's really easy in hindsight to say oh you shouldn't have done the, those moves but just thinking back to game week 12 what happened there is that newcastle got just completely destroyed by bournemouth which is like really surprising you don't really expect Bournemouth to to be that good against Newcastle Newcastle looked really tired in that game and Chelsea meanwhile scored four goals against Man City so could have easily seen Chelsea beat Newcastle on the basis of the basis of that but that didn't end up happening Newcastle were just finding their form again and they're they showed again that they're a really good team at home and Gordon as well he keeps blanking away from home and he keeps scoring at home so he's really like a, a home type of player that needs to play you need to play him when you have him at home, you play him, and when he plays away, you could probably bench him. So, so yeah. So, it's kind of like, kind of unlucky in that regard. It's like, looking at, going into the game week, it looked a bit better to get in Palmer for Gordon than what it ended up being, but that's what happens in FPL sometimes. So, so yeah. But other than that, what do you feel about uh, your, your game week? You actually had a pretty decent game week, apart from that. Um, 46 points if you take away the four points uh, from the transfer. Uh, that's actually a decent score this game week because this was a really terrible game week in general for for most people so i have a couple of returns from the arsenal guys gabriel and saka came through your captain holland came through watkins got a goal he also got a stupid yellow card which removed some of his bonus as well um so yeah what do you feel about the team and in, in general and, uh, and especially going forward as well because i think you have a pretty good team going forward apart from gusto and Tavares that you mentioned yeah i think um generally speaking pretty happy with the team and stuff obviously um, City and Liverpool were going to dwarf each other in terms of them facing each other so it's just a bit of a shame that it wasn't as free flowing as we expected it to be I did not expect it to be a 1-1 tight affair but that being said I felt that both definitely City uh, squandered a lot of their chances I think they could have easily have been a high scoring game but both teams were just I don't know if it was due to both teams being defending really compactly or whether it was just a lack of sort of concentration because 
I felt Julian Alvarez was invisible for most of that game or that they didn't incorporate him in. I also felt that Liverpool got super lucky to get a draw at the end of the day. Like, yes, they 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 had their chances, especially Darwin, who squandered a lot. Like, if his t- first touch had been slightly better, they probably he would have probably been the one to get the equalizer rather than a speculative shot from Trent Alexander-Arnold. Yeah. But um, that being said, I can't be unhappy with this. Yes, Trippier in a four goal sort of thing he was really unlucky as well though his free kick hit the bar and he also had an assist like basically just like a free assist for uh, Joe Linton who had a free header at the back post and he just missed it completely yeah so like I can't be mad at that I thought Palmer wasn't didn't have the best game Abuemu you know was a Declan Rice uh, clearance away from scoring wasn't the best shot from uh, Abuemu to be fair but was a good clearance from Declan Rice. I mean, he did everything he had to do. Um, just want to see this Kai Havertz goal. Oh, terrible. Um, Watkins, unlucky to get a bunch of offside goals uh, counted against them. Yeah, then of course, so close. Um, and you know, I thought generally speaking that Aston Villa weren't attacking with him in mind in that regards to. It just kept going past him. It kept going into the wings rather than going down central. And when it did go down central, of course, he scored. So really stupid yellow card as well. Um, I don't even feel that. I just hate referees, okay? I, I think they just complain about everything. And the minute they get some resistance, they, they think it's dissent. Fuck off. I, I, I If I ever saw a referee in their face, I'd tell them to fuck off. Because I'm sick and tired of them thinking that they have... And it makes sounds like a weird thing to say about referees because, of course, they're meant to have control of the game. But I feel like they're way too sensitive about some of the things. Of course, a player should have the right to moan about something. It's one thing if they tell them to fuck off like Wade Rooney did constantly throughout his career. That is actual dissent. But to, you know, just be annoyed over something, I think, is ridiculous. That referees who don't get so incensed by that are referees that I like because at the end of the day, people get naturally frustrated. So people are going to lose their goal. But yeah, yeah, it's stupid. It's not like he even kicked away the ball or anything. Um, in regards to uh, the rest of the team, obviously Arsenal did well with the uh, against uh, Brentford. Wasn't yeah, it? Brentford. Yeah. One nil against Brentford. Yeah. So Fleck and Ariola both got three points mm-hmm. each. So I, I, I don't. I was very grateful because at some point it looked like it might have ended nil nil. So yeah. then I would have been pissed off. But um, that being said, you know, well done by them. You know, it's the stuff that champions need to do if they have, if they still have the same ambitions of becoming uh, the Premier League champs. They gotta iron out these sort of wins. So well done. Finally, Gabriel gets to keep a clean sheet as well since I brought him in. Yeah. Um, so yeah. I, you know what? It was a pretty shit game week, and to end on 46 points is endorsed. Yeah, I think so too. And uh, like I said earlier, I think your team is looking well set up for the future. It's pretty similar to what I have for the week we walk our drafts, as we'll discuss eventually on this podcast. Let's move on to uh, Kimo and uh, his team. He had a terrible game week uh, in general, 33 points, not the best. He also did like a Kind of weird transfer, I think. Burn to Aguard. He did have two transfers available as well, so he could have done more differently. But his thinking was just Aguard plays against Burnley. That should be a clean sheet. But West Ham have proven that they can't keep clean sheets. And, uh, and yeah, uh, what's interesting about this, though, since he brought in Aguard, is the fact that he is now tripled up on West Ham, which is uh, <laughs> kind of crazy to say, especially seeing as he is not tripled up on a single other team. But, but yeah, it's basically just bottom of the barrel guys in terms of uh, value. So. Mubama, who actually got to play and, and uh, was really close to getting the goal as well. He could have got, gotten more than that at one point. Uh, he basically forced the, the equalizer for West Ham. And he should play, like, ask any West Ham fan. And, and we all know Mubama should play over Ings. But, but yeah, Mubama is 4.3, super cheap. Ariola is 4.3 as well as a goalkeeper, super cheap. And Aguirre is, what, 4.5? So, yeah, it's not the worst in terms of value, but... Triple West Ham seems a bit excessive at this point, especially if it's not Kudus and Suchik and all these guys who might be good FPL prospects. But, but either way, in general, pretty poor game week for Kimo. He's pretty unlucky with Son, I think. 
Son had so many chances for for Spurs against Asnola. He had several offside goals uh, taken away from him as well. Was it like three goals? Yeah, or something? I think it was three. Three. He put the ball into the back of the net three times, and it was offside all three times as well. Um, to be fair, though, that is sort of the tactics of Aston Villa. I think there were some stats that they had like almost twice as much put other people in offside compared to other teams in the Premier League so far. I think it's like they've done it like 150 times and the next team had done it like 70 times or something like that. Something crazy like that. So that's part of the tactics for Aston Villa to sort of put on the offside trap and make people go offside. But by the way, kind of lucky there with Son as captain. Kind of interesting uh, rogue captaincy shout, especially after both Salah and Holland blanked. A lot of Son captainers were really smug about it and thought that he was going to outscore them, but that didn't happen in the end. Uh, meanwhile, Saka, it's just really interesting to see Son and Saka, how different they've done the last three game weeks. Saka has basically looked not that big of a threat at all and has gotten points in every single game week. And then Son has looked really threatening and not gotten a single point. So a bit of variance there, which is kind of kind of strange to see. But yeah, we'll talk more about Son and Saka eventually as well. Um, so yeah, the one transfer, burnt to Aguard. Not too sure about uh, how I like that. I think if I were was going to get just like a cheap defender, I would have gone even cheaper than Aguard personally. I'd probably go with someone like Branthwaite or something. Because he does have cash, Trippier. Uh, Lamptey is out for a long time now, though, to be fair. Um, and Chimikas, so he has like a decent backline, I guess. But by the way, um, so yeah, uh, any comments about Kimo's team? What do you think about his son captaincy shout? Do you think it's? Uh, do you think he was unlucky? Do you think he probably should have been punished more? You said that you thought the Liverpool City game would have been more open, so... So what do you feel about the Son captaincy shout in general, both in hindsight and also before the game week? Before the game week, I would have said it's a fine captaincy choice. Like I would have maybe considered if I had him. Yeah. But considering the fact that the two boys who did score or got a goal and assist um, just proves that they're in the forms of their lives. And unfortunately, Son isn't because he's been really snatching at his chances but he's still been blanking right so at the end of the day i felt that going with holland was a safer pick and you know he did score at the end of the day so yeah but that's hindsight and then like all things considered because son again has had so many clear-cut chances that he's for whatever reason just not been able to convert on an onside position yeah. and also like when he is onside he like wasn't it like he gets a header that he should have just scored but he like either glanced it wide and stuff like that like everything that could go wrong for son did it, it very much reminded me of the looting game and very much reminded me of the sheffield united game where everything that could go wrong did um yeah. in the same vein I felt the same way about uh, Decore. He could have easily gotten a goal and assist in the uh, game against uh, United and looking like a tasty FPL prospect. But for whatever reason, in classic Everton curse, (laughs) couldn't just couldn't convert his chances. Um, That being said, um, I I, the Aguirre thing just seems like such a such a sideways move when you already have Ariola that like you're doubling down on. Not the most amazing defense, so yeah. Uh, personally, I wouldn't have done it. I would have, like he said, either gone for Brantwaite yeah. or look at my other options. Um, so yeah, I mean, I, I get it in regards against Burnley, but you guys weren't playing at home, right? Uh, no, away from home, yeah, yeah. So that's even more reason to not, you know, like completely back a defense that's not great yeah. if you had been at home it might have been a completely different game i'm i'm sure of it but yeah when you guys are playing away as well and without bowen so you lose you lose a little it's it's funny to say that you lose a bit of defense because the offense isn't a hundred percent there so yeah yeah i i, I think personally it's a it's a bit of a sideways move, but he's probably going to say, yeah, I'm doing better than you, so what are you to say anything to me? So <laughs> that's true. He that's, has... a very, that's a very chemo uh, response <laughs> to any uh, sort of criticism. Yeah, I mean, he has had a good season so far. He's uh, in yeah, the of course. top 170k, 809 yeah. points, slightly ahead of me, um, a couple points. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, he's had a good season. So so yeah, let's see if it uh, keeps up. He has some issues with his team, but we'll get to that at towards the end of the podcast where we look at our teams for game week fourteen. Uh, but let's move on to the manager of the week, which this week was uh, Gary Carter with sixty six points. That's the best uh, we found in our mini league, the FPL Scope mini league. You can also join the FPL Scope mini league and become the manager of the week if you score the highest point total in one particular game week. And the league code for the FL Scope in the league is V9JT0D. It would be really fun if you joined the league. There are quite a few people that have joined the league so far as well. And yeah, it's just fun to look at all the different teams and discuss it every podcast with you. Um, so this is the team. He actually kept Gordon. He sold Mitama to, to get Embuemo. He had enough money to do that straight up, which is something that you probably wish you would, would have been able to as well. Um, so that secured him 13 points from Gordon, 7 points from Lascelles uh, as well because he scored a goal. Former Gordon assists mm. that was huge for for Gary Carter in the in this game week, yeah. and the Saka points, and then basically just Holland and Salah and Watkins, those like typical players really. So, not really a huge score. Sixty six points is regularly like you're happy with that score, but it's basically just like a good game week in like a normal game week. But in this game week, where, where most people score like forty points at best, sixty six points is is really fantastic. So. So yeah, um, nice looking team in general, I think, as well. I think it's really well set up for the future. Already has Embuemo, already has Gordon, who's really popular now. Saka's one are popular, Salah's popular. Holland and Watkins seem like template picks. The defense is pretty pretty good and solid as well. So I think this team is, in general just looks really solid for the future. So um, anything that sticks out to you with this team uh, in general, it's pretty template, to be fair. But um, anything you would like to change with this team, or, or do you just like most of the team in general i generally speaking like this team i think it has a really good balance of different teams uh i yeah i think it's it is template in many regards but you know hall and walk-ins great have being able to have both salas on saka and boemo is really good and especially if you're considering moving from son it gives you so much freedom to mess around with and uh yeah you know um i very much like it it's just a question of um this guy is very clever because he benched the hell out of cash yeah third bench <laughs> uh and um yeah i think it's a really nice team i mean obviously there's um some things you could p- potentially fix but i think, I think uh, the defense in general is looking a bit weak but yeah uh, especially but if, other than that if Bachman comes back um, that's going to be tough for Lascelles, Guehi, Crystal Palace have not looked good lately, and they have tough fixtures. Taylor plays for Burnley, concede every game, and Cash is just looking like a bad pick. So I think the defense is basically, for me at least, the 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 thing that needs to be sorted out with this team. But other than that, I think the attack is just basically just like fantastic, great. Maybe you could have Palmer in there, uh, but then you would have to sell Gordon, I guess, which could work out, I guess. Um, but yeah, yeah, we'll see. Um, yeah, any other thoughts about this team um, in general? Or just speaking of Son, actually, um, you said that you could potentially see him sell, see him, this guy selling Son and getting some money to play around with. Uh, what do you feel about Son in general as a, a prospect after you're seeing him now with, in two games without Madison, like, and now also without Benton Kerr as well? I think that's a pretty huge thing. The fact that he got injured that sort of changed the game a bit as well. Like they looked, they didn't look as threatening in the second half Spurs as they did in the first half against Aston yeah. So. So what do you think about uh, Son and Spurs going forward after seeing them now for two games without Madison and losing both games? I mean, considering the chances that Son got, I think he is a hold player because, I mean, there were great chances. So I I think generally speaking, and, you know, with um, him being the clear penalty taker as well. We assume. We assume. Yeah, they still uh, haven't had a penalty yet, which is crazy. They've had so many penalty shouts, but it's they never seem to get it. Yeah, I mean, he's 100% the penalty taker. Yeah. At this point, because he hasn't scored as well, I think he'll 100%. <laughs> if, I don't know, Oliver Skip is good at penalties, it's still going to be so <laughs> taking those. So, um, oh, that Fernandez goal. Um, that being said, what is Spurs fixtures like because i think that's going to be the most deciding factor on whether you should keep son or not but that being said son scores in all the difficult games so yeah that's true i mean their fixtures are not great in terms of just looking at it straight up they have man city away which is obviously the toughest fixture 
West Ham yeah. at home, though, is, is a potential really huge game week for Son. But yeah. Newcastle, <clears throat> Newcastle is, a t- is a tough team. Nottingham Forest away could be tough, but now they lost 3-2 against Brighton at home, so so maybe, maybe not so tough. And then Everton, which is usually where Son scores. So it's a bit of a yeah. mixed bag, but like, I don't know. Um, like, like you said, Son can score against anyone as well, so so maybe it's it doesn't really matter that much. And I think Spurs will play offensively against anyone as well. Like they showed that against Chelsea with nine men playing <laughs> that high line, the ridiculous high line and stuff. So, but yeah, I think more than anything, they should be very happy that they're not in any of the European sort yeah, of competitions because at this rate, their squad could not handle it. So, yeah, I think uh, yeah, someone could be a cheeky little differential but it's just the question of how he's going to fix the defense i'll be honest i i never was sold on cash and i i keep feeling like i'm being proven right with that but like i don't think cash is the best asset he's super lucky to be fair like he could have scored in the game against luton and all and i keep but if i feel like a broken record at this point i keep saying about all the amazing things he could have done but hasn't and i'm I don't have him, so I feel pretty pretty good in that position. So, and also Aston Villa are super leaky, just generally yeah. speaking. I think they concede way too much, and mm. I don't know if that's Martinez's fault. I don't know if it's you know maybe Tyrone Mings is that guy, and <laughs> we've been hating on him for no reason. But yeah, I, I think cash to someone else could be a nice way of uh, going about this. Yeah. Definitely, we can definitely definitely downgrade cash and, and potentially upgrade in one of their defenders uh, as well. And we're going to get to that uh, towards the end of the podcast because uh, those are basically some of my suggestions as well for this team going forward. But yeah, those are the scores from this week. Like I said, my own score and uh, my own team plans is going to come out on the Friday for my own team selection video. Uh, but yeah, let's move on to the predictions that we do every week, and uh, these are the results from the predictions from last week. You have one correct scoreline, and that was the mighty West Ham managed to get two one against Burnley. Hey, I didn't even realize that I did that. That's I thought well. this week went fucking dog shit. So it yeah. did go pretty dog shit because you only had three correct results in general. <laughs> um, only Bournemouth beating Sheffield United, no surprise there, and Arsenal beating Brentford, no surprise there either, really. Um, and then West Ham beating Burnley, but apart from that, uh, only yeah only uh, the wrong results for you i had one better result than you and that was basically man city against liverpool which probably should have been a man city win to be honest but at the same time i don't know it was still a pretty like even game i think liverpool could have taken their chances better and allison was just like one of the worst games i've seen from him as well like he was completely at fault for several like big chances for man city in the first half so so yeah but two two there um but yeah in general looking over this game week um any of the games where you feel like in hindsight, you probably should have seen it coming, or like you had the the bold move to go with a Chelsea win away against Newcastle. Um, we discussed yeah. that a bit, and that ended up being four one for Newcastle. So, what made you go with the Chelsea win, and uh, how do you see the match in general? Uh, I I thought it was a Chelsea win because I wasn't sure that Isak was going to play. I I did say in the podcast as well, if yeah. Isak plays, they're going to win, and that's exactly what happened. Yeah. Isak just gives them, even in the game against uh, PSG just gives them a completely different dynamic than um uh, wilson like i think isak is way more dynamic so and especially with is, uh, rather than gordon which was the last game against bournemouth they didn't have any yeah. striker yeah and you can see why because in both the ways he scored against both chelsea and especially the the goal against uh, psg which psg yeah um it's such a striker's finish, you know, just letting the ball hit the goalie and go for the rebound. Like that, that's only something a good striker has, you know, the presence, sort of the bare, bare goal, like, oh, just being at the right place at the right time. Yeah, he just gives them a completely different dynamic. So the minute I saw that he was starting, I was just like, yeah, my prediction's already gone mm. out the window. Um, I think one of the biggest, um, Shocks. Uh, shock. I wouldn't go as far as shock. Um, I wouldn't have said two one to Nottingham had I known that uh, Awani was injured. Yeah. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, so I might have been more. I I didn't expect them to lose, but I I wouldn't have been so high on them. Yeah. Um, 
I have no idea what happened between Fulham and Wolves. I just realized what <laughs> happened in that game. Uh, Fulham ended up winning with uh, several uh, VAR decisions going against Wolverhampton, as always, pretty much. So, so what did the Williams scored two penalties, three two for Fulham. Um, they scored a, a they scored a, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Oh. They scored they scored a pretty uh, early goal. Avobi, your former Everton Everton man, scored the opening goal. Yeah. Anthony Robertson, nice assist. Then Wolves uh, struck back, scored. Um, was it? I can't remember the first goal. Oh, it was uh, Cunha from really good, um, really nice setup from Belgard as well, who's one of my favorite players, uh, like hidden gems in the Premier League. Uh, and then they got a penalty for them, and William stepped up to take it with Andreas Pereira on the pitch. And then Wolf struck back with another penalty from them. Huang Hee Chan actually took the penalty for them, which is crazy. I thought it was going to be Cunha. Um, and then William got a penalty towards the end, like at injury time as well. And especially the first penalty was just completely wrong. Like, um, can't remember. In Semedo, I think, got the ball and then like barely grazed the foot of the um, opposing player, and then yeah, Fulham got the penalty. I think the final penalty was actually like more correct, sort of like it was definitely a, like a touch on Wilson who went to ground pretty easily, but still. Um, but yeah, <laughs> really have to feel hard done by for Wolves who just. I don't know. They they keep impressing against the the bigger teams, and then they keep like messing up against these smaller teams, and they keep getting refereeing decisions against them. So, so yeah, I was very very surprised because I had it as a two 0 Wolves win. At least you had it as a draw for Fulham, but probably should have been a draw in terms of what happened towards the end. But, but yeah, that's pretty much what happened in that game. Um, but yeah, um, apart from that, I think for me. Um, I was kind of surprised to see Man United beat Everton 3-0 but I don't think it should win 3-0 I think it should be closer to probably a draw or yeah, just a squeaky Man United win potentially uh, Spurs Aston Villa as well I was I was pretty upfront about it last week that I was like not sure about this game at all I did not <laughs> cannot really predict it one way or the other that's why I went with 2-2 uh, and it could have ended with a draw to be fair as well uh, potentially should have as well and then Arsenal is just like the the weird team in general. Like in the Premier League, they look kind of I don't know lethargic. Is that the word for it? They don't look that like spry and and really offensively minded. And then in the Champions League, all of a sudden they just completely destroy and win five nil, scoring beautiful goals left and right, like we just saw now against Lance in the Champions League. So, so yeah, that's also kind of surprising that they, they didn't make it more like an easy game against Brentford, but. Nice for Kai Havertz scoring the the winning goal as well. He scored the opening goal against Lance as well, so it's pretty huge for him, I think, uh, in general. Even though that doesn't really affect of FPL, course. that doesn't really affect FPL too much. But, but yeah, any other final thoughts about uh, the gaming thirteen fixtures, or should we move ahead to the future? What happened in Luton Crystal Palace? Is, was it a draw? No, Luton won. Got their first home win. <laughs> You haven't been paying attention. Yet. I have not been paying attention this <laughs> this game week to be complete. Like from the looks of it, I, hey, if if you're if you're uh, like Kevin and you haven't seen any of the Premier League results, you can go back and watch my uh, FPL eye tests video that I had earlier this week, and I go through each and every game there, talk about every game and what happened. So who, who scored the winner for Luton? Oh God damn it! <laughs> it was uh, Brown. Crystal Palace. Yeah, I don't oh. even remember the first name of him. Brown. Uh, yeah, nice cross from Ogbena, who's another really good uh, hidden gem, I think, in the in the Premier League. So yeah, they they beat Crystal Palace, which is uh, kind of bad for Crystal Palace, but yeah, first home win for Luton as well, because they beat you guys mm-hmm. at Goodison Park, I think, because you guys suck at home. <laughs> yeah, yeah, pretty much. Ah oh, well, okay. Yeah, let's move on to the future. We've talked enough about the past. Let's look ahead to the next few games. And uh, I'm probably not going to go through... We usually go through each and every game, but we've already spent about half an hour so far in the podcast. So we still have quite a lot to talk about. But just going through the games just quickly, um, we have Arsenal against Wolves. I've uh, said 2-1 for Arsenal. Just a small win there, because like I said, I think Wolves are pretty good against the bigger teams. And Arsenal haven't really proven in the Premier League that they can destroy teams uh, as they have done in the Champions League. You have faith, more faith in Arsenal, though. You have 3-0 for Arsenal. So it is a pretty big game. So let's just uh, have your thoughts about that game as well in general. Uh, what makes you think that Arsenal will just ease past Wolves after seeing them against Brentford and now against Lance, I guess, uh, and I think, Wolves this season as well? I think generally speaking, they seem to have... I can't... I'm not 100% sure, but I feel like they normally translate their champions league week to a decent week sort of thing like they tend to do pretty well in the week that they play in the champions league so um i didn't base it off of that 
because we did the results before the game started. Yeah. So, um, but I had a feeling that Arsenal were going to do decently. And that's why I think it's just going to roll into the Premier League as well. You know, a huge win in the Champions League at home, win against Wolves as well. You know, it's good times are rolling. So if City somehow screw up against uh, Spurs, um, it's going to look even better. So they know that they have to sort of set the tone with being the first game of the whole um, sort of game week and, you know, all this type of stuff. So I think Arsenal are just going to go for it. Um, now, especially considering the fact that uh, I didn't even know that Wolves lost. Uh yeah, I'll, I'll say that. They lost in London. They're going to lose <laughs> in London again. It, it all it comes full circle. So um, I also think it's a bit wishful thinking. I, I was originally going to say 3-1, but I have Gabriel in my fantasy team, so I need him yeah. to keep a clean sheet. Uh, I saw in the highlights against Lons, he did a really good block as well and apparently had a really good game. So yeah, I'll, I'll give him the clean sheet. Bukayo Saka is looking really good. Jesus is looking really good Kai Havertz is looking good so I think they're gonna go for it and um, they need to start winning these sort of matches because that was their biggest flaw last season yeah. so and I think with the Brentford win as well they're showing that these are the sort of games that they can start ironing out so and hell they beat City this season so yeah, yeah. I think I think they're gonna start grinding these games out Fair enough. Uh, I think also it, it could be 3-0 because Wolves also struggle a bit more away from home than they do at home. Um, but yeah, I, I think it's just like in general, just the way Arsenal have looked in the Premier League so far. But but seeing them against Lons, I was really impressed. And I know that they have that in them because they showed that last season. And it's not like Erdogan, Martinelli, Saka, all those guys have become terrible players overnight. And also just having no, Jesus back as the starting striker like more consistently, I think it's going to help them massively as well because he does so much. He, he's not a good goal scorer, but apart from that, he's a fantastic striker. So, so yeah. Uh, next up, Brentford against Luton. Don't really have to say much about this game. Luton away from home have been pretty atrocious all season. Brentford are pretty decent home side. A two win margin we both have. I have 2-0 for Brentford. You have 3-1 for Brentford against Luton. Luton do, to be fair, kind of get the scrappy goals here and there. So, so yeah, don't really have to say too much about this game, uh, I think. Uh, moving on to Burnley, Sheffield United. Another <laughs> game that we probably shouldn't talk <laughs> about that much. It is basically just a championship match uh, between two teams that should not play in the Premier League, in my opinion. Uh, I've gone with 2-0 for Burnley. I think Burnley are just a better team than Sheffield United in general. You've gone with 1-1, which I think is kind of surprising to see as Sheffield United are the away team as well. Um, but yeah, just quick thoughts, like... Or do you want to have quick thoughts about this game? <laughs> just keep it brief, I guess. No, sorry, I just saw a tweet on the TV that said, Andre Onana, the Darwin Nunez of Golkin. Mm. That's so, <laughs> so rude to both players. To Anyways, both players, um, um, I just think both teams are shit, to be completely honest. That's yeah. kind of why I went for this. But, you know, if Burnley can sort of show, if they can show anything that they showed against West Ham, then they're going to win the game against Sheffield United because I think Sheffield United are such bottom of the barrel bullshit. So, yeah. yeah. Um, but we'll, we'll have to wait and see. I don't think it's inconceivable to for Burnley to get like a comfortable win. Um, but I also see Sheffield United making it in a scrappy sort of game because this is the sort of game they have to get points in. So, Definitely. yeah. Yeah, fair enough. And I think 1-1 is just like, it is really like an easy prediction to have for games that you don't really care about in NFL. <laughs> it's yeah, like 1-1, one, one, a random goal for each team, doesn't uh, affect us in NFL, don't have to think about it, just yep. move it out of the world. And it might also be wishful thinking, because Burnley, I do think they're going to go down, uh, but they are a bigger threat to Everton's uh, relegation uh, potential than uh, than Sheffield United are. So it might be wishful, wishful thinking. And speaking of Everton and wishful thinking, You've gone with an Everton win away from home, which is typically where they do get their wins, actually. But it's away against Nottingham Forest, who are usually better at home. But we saw Nottingham Forest lose against Brighton at home uh, this time around. So, so you think Everton can repeat that that thing? Because you have 2-1 for Everton. I have 1-1. I think Everton are better than, than Nottingham Forest in general as a team. Uh, but I think just the fact that it's uh, at City ground um, is going to make it 1-1, basically. Um, so yeah, what are your hopes for this game as, as an Everton fan? And... Uh, yeah, how tightly contested do you think the game will be in general? Oh, it's very tightly contested. If you remember last year, 
Everton should have won that game. I don't even remember what happened in the end. I think it ended 2-2 with Brennan Johnson going crazy against us. Mm. Um, but it's usually like a fun game. So could I see us winning like sort of in the vein that we did against Crystal Palace? Yes. But we just need to because Jack Harrison looks great. Dakuri looks great. Calvert Lewin is the one who sort of looked a bit iffy against Man United out of all the players. But the team, generally speaking, looks good. Like we said, it was a flattering result for Manchester United. And I have belief in the guys to do something, especially away from home, because that seems to be where all the points are coming from. This is the sort of game that we need to win to continue, because this 10-point deduction is complete bullshit. And this is the sort of game where we have to sort of get a result. The Manchester United loss, yes, is you could argue that we need to win that game too, but I, I told you going in, I would. it doesn't surprise me if we lost that game. I just want us to win the game. And in normal circumstances, yes, it'd be a bit sour that we lost to Man United, but it's Man United at the end of the day. Yep. The Premier League's... Uh, 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 Darling. form form team, yeah. kings and all this bullshit but you know i take a loss against them it's the losses against like full of wolves and all these other bullshit Luton. teams fucking loot and and drawing against your and i fuck off these are the <laughs> games we have to be winning and i reckon we can do a result against uh against Nottingham Forest. Fair enough. Uh, speaking of Man United, they play against Newcastle away, which, is, as we know, is one of the toughest fixtures there is. And I think that's going to be uh, pretty much uh, what's going to happen in this game, that Newcastle are going to be the better team and uh, just defeat Man United 3-0 quite easily. I think Man United are there to be to be messed around with, I guess. Uh, so I have huge faith in Isak. We've talked a bit about him. Uh, I think he could potentially score a couple goals in this game as well. Uh, Yugon would have more closely contested the game, uh, which is usually the case for Man United in most games, apart from when they play City. Um, Yugon with 2-1 for Newcastle, so you still have faith in Newcastle, obviously, at home to, to Man United. But do you think it's going to be like a tight affair, or do you think... Yeah, what, what do you reckon about this game? Yeah, especially after the fucking devastation that was this game against Galatasaray, where they were two, both 2-0 two up and 3-1 up, right? Yeah. Or something like that, so... Um, Losing a two-goal lead in <laughs> twice is uh, is crazy. So, yeah, I think uh, Manchester United are going to make a response. I think they've looked, I, I, in the league, they've looked pretty good and all this type of stuff, and Garnacho score. So, yeah. yes, but that being said, do I think Newcastle's result uh, of a draw away against PSG is better than... Uh, Manchester United away to Galatasaray yes so I still think Newcastle are going to edge it out especially they're, they're showing that St. James Park isn't somewhere you can you know it's very much a fuck around find out sort of yeah. situation so I mean they're, they're won, yes. they won every home game apart from the Liverpool game where they conceded yeah. twice towards the end yeah and I think that's more than fair enough and I that's why I think them running away with it is completely fair I just think that Manchester United might make it a little bit more interesting. Yeah. Um, I hope not. I hope it's 3 <laughs> 0. Once I get Isak in and he gets a brace, beautiful. And that Gordon does nothing, or even better. But uh, we'll see. Um, I think 2 1 isn't completely unreasonable either yeah. in that regard. So I, I think Man United can keep it tight, but I still think they'll lose. Speaking about getting Isak in, one of the ways you could do that is potentially selling Oli Watkins. But it does not seem, judging by the predictions you have, Aston Villa have 3-1 against Bournemouth, that that would be a wise move because you think Aston Villa will win this away game against Bournemouth. I'm more sort of like on the fence with this one because I think Bournemouth have looked a lot better <laughs> lately. Uh, granted, they played against uh, Sheffield United last time, but they looked really good and they've looked good against Newcastle as well uh, at home. Um, I think they're turning like a corner now and they look a lot better and I don't really trust Aston Villa away too much either so I think it's going to be a pretty close game. Uh, you going with 3-1 for Aston Villa though so, so you don't seem to think the same as me I guess but, uh, but yeah what do you think about this game uh, as well with Aston Villa and like they're riding high they beat Spurs just now away from home as well so yeah so yeah. 
I, I think uh, a lot of it will also um, do with the fatigue from the Conference League. Uh, so potentially they could be really tired going into this game, but I think they're just riding the hide right now and Holly Watkins looks really good. Um, I feel that Leon Bailey has looked really good. Yeah, it's yeah. just so weird to say that the Abbey lo- didn't look good, but I think with the Abbey, he was just played out of position, which is why it didn't look as good as it, I know the Abbey can be. Uh, but generally speaking, um, I think they're just looking good under an Emery. I've always rated him as a manager. It's it is fun to see him doing well. I just wish it wasn't Aston Villa. <laughs> the reason why is because Aston Villa are very similar to us as a club in that regard. So mm. a part of me was always wishing that we got Unai Emery and not them. So, <laughs> yeah. And I think that's where my hatred for them and also because the Villa fans just like dragging everyone on the mud. <laughs> so, um, yeah, but I think Aston Villa have what it takes. I think Irol has definitely found his form and, you know, things are looking good. But uh, I think Aston Villa just might be a task a bit too much for them. Yeah, I mean, in terms of like the the difference between the squads, Aston Villa obviously have the much better players, I think, in general. I think Bournemouth, mm-hmm. to be fair, have some really underrated talents there. Tavernier as well, mm-hmm. scoring twice now. I think he's like a underrated sort of FPL asset because he is a really streaky player. He was that last season as well, at least. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I think it's just going to be a really close game. I think it's going to be a really interesting game in general as well. It's just a shame that it goes at the same time as three other games <laughs> on the Sunday. I don't really know why they have all the games at the same time. Uh, pretty much uh, both days but but yeah Uh, another game that is uh, going to happen on the Sunday at the same time is Chelsea against Brighton and I don't think I can really judge this game either it's just two really unpredictable teams I think Chelsea and Brighton I think they look fantastic at their best they look really terrible at their worst that's why I've just gone with 2-2 like I I can't really decide I think it's going to be a high scoring game and and that's it basically just 2-2 Chelsea do play at home, so, so maybe that counts for them. But at the same time, they've been pretty poor at home this season. That's where they've had the losses against Nottingham Forest and uh, and Brentford. So so yeah, I think it's just too tough to call this game. So I have it two two. Uh, you have gone with a two one Chelsea win. Um, what goes into that result for you? Yeah, I think the um, sort of something it's got to give because. I'm reading articles about how much feet of I get sacked, and I'm like, what the hell is going on? Like, it's Chelsea. Yes, it's, yeah. yeah, it is Chelsea, but at the <laughs> end of the day, they've done some really interesting things as well. So, and gone some really good results. It's just that it does take time to gel 500 million players all at once. So, yeah. I, <laughs> they've also been really unlucky with Nkunku being out because I, I say Nkunku virtually starts at every single club. Like, I, I, no bullshit. I think that's how good of a talent he is. And the minute he comes back, I think they'll look better. I think Nicholas Jackson will be one of the players who, uh, out of everyone, <laughs> probably misses him the most because yeah. them during the preseason linked up like crazy. It was like looking at a prime Gabriel and Gabriel in Jesus and Martinelli because they it's just it just made a lot of sense for them. They yeah. they're both very similar in uh, unselfishness, which seems like a bullshit thing to say considering how selfish Nicholas Jackson has been at Chelsea lately. But I think that's mainly due to confidence issues yeah. that he's now having to snatch at every chance. It's sort of like Sterling at the what was it World Cup or Euros where instead of doing the traditional thing that he does, he just kept trying to shoot, which uh, cost England. Um, So um, with that being said, I feel like once in Cuckoo's back, Chelsea are going to look better. Chelsea have been really unlucky this year with their home form. So I feel like something's going to give. And I'll be honest, I'm kind of sick and tired of the Serbi's uh, stupid-ass rotation (laughs) when he's like, oh... Ferguson got a hat trick last week. Let me bench him this week. I, I've never understood that. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to think he's he's like, <laughs> like a unprimed Pep. Like when Pep used to also do the Pep Roulette, but Pep Roulette worked. Obviously, he got winning results and all this type of stuff. Yes, he had City and much better pool of players. But when you have a, such a talented core like Brighton have, why do you fuck around with it so much? Why don't you find? A consistent 11 and go with it why don't you just play ferguson or pedro 
depending on which one is playing well or play both you know you don't have to be stingy and i, I if, like fucking moist uh, let's not play corny ever okay why yeah. another talented player just getting wasted because the manager doesn't utilize them properly so you know what fuck brayden you know what <laughs> fuck the serbia i hope chelsea win i'm getting sick and tired of this shit Fair enough. also because <laughs> also because i've had brayden players and natoma spurred me uh, pretty badly this season so and also because the biggest reason to support Brighton this season has now been injured, Ansu Fati. So oh, spare course. a thought for Ansu Fati. Sad with all the injuries with him. It seems like he's out long-term now, which is a huge bummer. But, but yeah, another each, bad injury for Brighton. Each like uh, this video gets is for your jobs. I hate when people <laughs> used to say that. so fucking great. Uh, yeah, maybe but yes. Help. Uh, yeah. Why we do love you, Ansu Fati. Of course. Um, then next we have Liverpool against Fulham. Again, don't really have to say much about this game. We both expect Liverpool to just trash Fulham. Uh, we don't really have much faith in Fulham this season. I would actually like to go back and see like all our predictions so far and just make a table out of the predictions because I think it's going to be a pretty crazy table because obviously we sort of react to the, the last game again and think that like now is finally the time Fulham will get destroyed. And they somehow seem to like get results here and there like they did now against Wolves. But Liverpool away from home. That's too tough, on, tough of a task for them. And I'm going 3-0 for Liverpool. You're going 4-0 for Liverpool. That also sort of um, tells you something about who we think is potentially the best captain to the option this week. Because, um, yeah, Salah against Fulham at home. Really good fixture for him. Um, yeah, I don't really think we need to comment much more about that game. Uh, West Ham Crystal Palace, I think this is probably the only game we have the same scoreline. Yeah, this is the only game we have the same scoreline this, this week. And that's a 2-1 West Ham win. We're both riding the high of West Ham beating Crystal Palace, or Burnley 2-1 last game week. And we're going for the same again uh, against Crystal Palace at home. Um, yeah, uh, any thoughts? I'm a West Ham fan, obviously, so I'm, I'm wishing for a 2-1 win. I think Crystal Palace have not looked the best lately, and West Ham just seem to churn out these, these wins uh, here and there. Um, probably another Suchek winner. Kudus has looked really good lately as well. Bowen potentially back. He's not going to play in the in the Europa League, but maybe he'll be back for the weekend. But, but yeah, uh, what do you think uh, goes into this game and the 2-1 win for West Ham? Do you think they have what it takes to beat Palace easily or, or is it going to be tough? Uh, do you think potentially it could be a draw or potentially even a loss? It just cut off exactly as you said that. I just heard yeah. something and then loss. Okay. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But do you think? Do you think there's uh, like? Do you think West Ham will will get the win like quite easily, or do you think yeah. it's, it could be a draw yeah. or even a Palace win? These are if pretty Eze, these, these results. If Eze wasn't injured, I would have said it would have been a more interesting sort of Londonish derby. Yeah. Um, but considering the fact that he got injured, I'm pretty sure he's out for the game as well. Yeah. I also back you guys at the London Stadium. So I think, uh, yes, Bowen's a big miss, but I think Eze is a bigger miss, if that makes sense. Um, I don't mean to um, disqualify Bowen because obviously Bowen's better than the entire um, Crystal Palace team together. That's a bit of an exaggeration, but um, I think Eze is a huge miss for them because they don't have the same squad that you do. Yeah. You guys made sure to sort of get the paquette, the board prowesses of the world and have a pretty decent squad. Uh, Elise is dangerous, though. If he gets cooking, he any, a, anything can happen. He's and Edouard really nice is, goal. He's and Edouard is... Uh, Edouard, you know, he just... I, I've always thought he was very good at Celtic, and it, it's sort of been a shame that Palace was the club that he went to. I would have loved him at Everton, for example, but, um, you know, he can cook too, but I think you guys are just too strong at home. Yeah. You got Moise, so David Moise will uh, get you that win, and uh, Moise out can wait for another week. Yeah, hopefully you get another fantastic goal because usually West Ham's like best goals the past ten years are pretty much all against Crystal Palace. You have the Paye free kick, we have the uh, Lancini like juggle goal, we have the Carroll bicycle kick. I think we have a like, Haller bicycle kick as well. I think against Palace uh, potentially as well. So West Ham seems to score like wonder goals against Crystal Palace. So hopefully that continues. Maybe Kudus will have like uh, his highlights so far for West Ham because yeah he's a fantastic player as well really looking forward to see him play every week so, so yeah he's another FPL prospect that we could potentially talk more about as well in the future but let's move on to the final game of this uh, upcoming game week and that is Man City and Spurs 
pretty huge game, but I think in terms of just Spurs having so many injuries, Man City playing at home at the Etihad, and this is something that I learned today, um, that Man City, the, the draw against Liverpool is the first time in 2023 they haven't won at home in all competitions. They've beaten Real Madrid, they've beaten Bayern, they've beaten every single opposition in the Premier League until they drew now against Liverpool, uh, which is crazy. And I think that's going to continue now. I have a 3-1 for Man City. You have 2-1 for Man City. Pretty close affair for you. Um, so yeah, what do you think uh, about this game as well? 2-1, um, not the biggest result for City. Um, yeah, what do you think about this game? I just, generally speaking, feel that uh, City Spurs has become like one of those weird... Like, it's sort of not a rivalry because it's very much the uh, Joel Embiid, <laughs> they always kick our ass sort of thing. But it's also one of those matches where I've seen Spurs get some crazy results, but usually they get the crazy result at home rather than them coming to the Etihad to do so. So, uh, but that being said, I think... Um, 2-1 might have been a bit too generous from my side, but I feel like they have to sort of... It, again, it's it's all about responses and stuff like that, and I think um, the Aston Villa result was not something they were expecting, especially going into knowing that they had City next as well. It's a bit of a catastrophe. I think 3-1 is more likely, um, but you know what? Ange versus Pep, you know, mate versus a guy who doesn't know how to differentiate of players. Fair enough. You know, uh, I think anything can happen. I think Son will score in this game. But <laughs> speaking of, speaking of Korean guys. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I, I think um, I think three one seems actually more reasonable, and is it is the it. result. I was actually close that, to going four one. Yeah, like I think. I think City could absolutely batter them. Of course, the yeah. lighting went off Light out. <laughs> just now. Uh, but um, that being said, Pep has like bogey teams, and I feel like Spurs is like one of those. Spurs yeah, and Crystal yeah. Palace that that he had seem to be like his uh, his bo- like sort of bo- bogey teams. Yeah. Also, think Poch has gotten the best out of. Um, out of him too in regards to uh hoodoo Chelsea teams City. and hoodoo co- coaches yeah um so it's it's fucking espanol it's any team so any team that Poch has spurs and is there any other team that i can think of not currently but uh that's besides the point i think i think spurs could make it a little bit more Exciting, Kulisevsky usually always has a good game against City as well, so yeah. wouldn't uh, surprise me if Kulisevsky, um, I think he just tends to do well in big games for Spurs, generally speaking, so yeah, uh, I think um, um, you can quote me, Kula will get an assist, and then at 7-0, then don't quote me. <laughs> yeah, fair enough, but yeah, like I said, I actually was pretty close to going 4-1 for Man City, and uh, partly the reason for that is just looking at Spurs' last few fixtures. They obviously lost three in a row, but just looking at the numbers here, this is the fixture ticker with some sets to go along with it. Looking at the worst three teams who are expected goals conceded, obviously we have Luton, not so surprising. We have yeah. Sheffield United as the worst team, but then the third worst team for expected goals conceded is Spurs. And granted, one of those games was... Uh, more than a half or about a half against Chelsea with uh, with nine men and still playing a high line. Obviously, that plays into it. But I think the, the defensive numbers for Spurs now, and especially seeing as they don't have Romero or Van de Ven, and seeing how bad they were defensively last season uh, without Van de Ven only. Um, yeah, I think they're there for the taking. Romero and Van de Ven are still out. They played with Ben Davis and, um, and Emerson Royale, centre-backs last time around. So I think it could be a, a real huge assault for City, and that's why I'm sort of like on the fence when it comes to captaincy. Uh, we can discuss that. Yeah, we can discuss that now. To be fair, um, captaincy mostly it's going to be between Salah and Holland. Both have really good fixtures, in my opinion. Spurs at home, like I said, I think they're there for the taking in terms of uh, them defensively. Uh, but then Liverpool play Fulham at home, and we both have a huge full or Liverpool win in that game. So. So what are your thoughts about the captaincy? I know you're going to go with Salah, or so far you're leaning towards Salah as captain. I'm doing that too. I slightly lean Salah, but I'm 
kind of having second thoughts. Maybe I should go for Holland because I think these games, like for example against Man United, like these big games where they play against teams that play offensive football still, that's probably where Holland is the most dangerous because he's not the best against like the better teams. He has struggled a bit, especially in the Champions League, for example, in the knockout stages uh, last season towards the end. Uh, but in these these games where he plays like a weak defense in a huge game, I think that's that usually bodes well for Holland. So. Yeah, what do, what do you think about the Salah Holan captaincy dilemma for this this game week in particular? I think you just sort of have to give it to which which team or which um, yeah, like you you sort of have to look at which team is playing the weaker opposition, right? And out of the two, Liverpool are facing Fulham, who suck and. Spurs are, you know, up there trying to win the Premier League at this rate and how well they're doing and all this type of stuff. So that is what dictates me for Salah versus um, Holland. But Holland's freaking nature. He's back into the form of his life. You know, what is it? Um, if we look at Holland's fixtures, what went crazy against uh, United, went crazy against. Um, Chels when scored against Liverpool wouldn't surprise me if he if he um, scores against Spurs. However, Salah's playing Fulham. Yeah. So that's the old, and <laughs> it's at Anfield. You know, I have no idea who they're uh, facing in the um, what shitty tournament are they in? Europa League. <laughs> I just. I, hey, I, hey, I just, hey, 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 don't speak relax, like that about the relax, 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 relax. I know relax, Everton has been in Europe for a long time, but don't okay, speak badly about the... Uh, a, a, fuck off. B, I just get to be smug about not being in the Europa League because Barcelona finally managed to stay in the Champions League without Messi for the first time in three, four years. So fucking let... Just let me have this, okay? Uh, but that being said, with Liverpool playing in the Europa League and stuff too, it'll be interesting to see what or how Salah Sala does because Holland yeah. scored in the game. I, I can't remember if he started or not. Maybe it was Julian Alvarez that came on. Um, yeah. But that being said, it is Spurs. You know, like, they are a bit of a hoodoo team. Yes, I can see Holland scoring. Yes, I can even see Holland scoring a hat-trick. But I, I just believe that Salah can do with the business against Fulham. I just believe that he'll do more. I think they'll cause more penalties. Salah is the pen guy. Yada, yada. I, I don't know. Like, I think I'm leaning heavily on Salah. Unless some crazy injury comes out of uh, the Spurs camp. Mm -hmm. That's the only thing that... Uh, I mean, yeah, on top of the injuries they already have. Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So if anything were to happen, then we'll, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll find out. But yeah, I think Salah takes it for me. Yeah. I think this is, I think it's tough. I think, um, I feel a bit justified in, in, um, Holland getting two points more than Salah last week because I said, you know, Holland's the guy who's playing at home and stuff, but now with both playing at home, but one's facing, uh, significantly easier team than the other yeah but who knows maybe maybe don't uh underestimate the mighty fulham so <laughs> yeah they have gotten some scrappy results in the past uh, i think uh and i just looked at salah's record against fulham as well and he hasn't really gone like huge bonkers against fulham in the past either he has like four different games where he scored one goal and that's it and that's pretty much all he has against fulham he doesn't have that huge hole yet against fulham but this is also uh, yeah a Fulham team that is there for the taking. So I think Salah is, is a really good captain's option. I think Juan is a really good captain's option as well. Um, but yeah, it's just slightly leaning towards Salah, but I'm, I have some, some some second thoughts about it as well. I'll, I'll also look at the Liverpool game against uh, Las Glintz now in the Europa League. They need to win that game. I or They don't need to win it, but if they win that game, they have pretty much secured number one and going through without all that qualification bullshit you have to go through if you end up number two in the group. Uh, but speaking of Liverpool as well, they don't just have Salah as a, as an interesting prospect. Looking at their next four fixtures, I think it's a lot of good games when it comes to scoring goals. Crystal Palace away, maybe not, but 
apart from that, I think they could score a lot of goals in this game. And Darwin Nunez is the one that I brought in myself last uh, this past game week, and I'm pretty excited about him going forward. Um, how do you feel about uh, Darwin going forward and also his chances of starting each and every game? Because we have Gakpo coming back, or, or he's, he's back from injury now. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm considering actually, um, and this might be contradicting whatever I said, uh, but, or, oh, fucking Bellingham. Um, I might be contradicting in the sense that I'm considering bringing Darwin and I, I have for a while. And yeah, I think if I get rid of Aston Villa's Watkins, who doesn't have the best matches in the next couple of games and Liverpool who really do. Yeah. I think, I think I'm considering Darwin a lot now to the point where I might actually bring Darwin in with uh, someone, someone cheeky instead of, Julian Alvarez, I think. Do I have enough to bring in both him and Isak? I think I might do if I. Yeah, if you do Watkins. Well, yeah, you can. I Watkins and Julian Alvarez. Watkins and Alvarez to, uh, to Isak and um, and Mr. Darwin. But, but yeah, I think both Isak and or I think both Watkins and Alvarez also have like decent fixtures. So yes, I don't really know. Um, for me, it would be too risky. But you like more of that type of risk taking sort of maneuver, and I know you like both Darwin and Isak for a field prospects wise, and I like them both as well as we'll get to in the next segment. But, but yeah. Um, so yeah, you think Darwin will play every game, or do you think he'll be rested in one yeah, of these games? Or I, I feel like the one who might get sort of like substituted is the fact that Jota was the one who went off injured, which means that Luis Diaz is back on the menu but that being said with that the issue then becomes is darwin their starting striker which i think he is so if darwin is their starting striker i think they're going to keep playing him he's been flying for uruguay as well so i I, and he he, what he gets assists he gets goals he, he doesn't explode for Liverpool just yet, but I feel like the explosion is coming. Yeah, I mean, he certainly gets enough chances <laughs> to to warrant that explosion at some point. So, yeah, and what better way to do it than Fulham and Sheffield United, which is the next two games, which is really, really good. So, I'm very excited about having triple Liverpool in general. I have Jimmy Cos as well, who I think is going to play uh, going forward. Sal obviously is, is a mainstay in, in the Premier League, at least until he goes to the African Cup of Nations. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, speaking of potential blanks in the future, we also have blanks for the first time, um, I think this season, apart from like gimmick two, I think with Luton and uh, what was it? Can't remember, but whatever, Luton Burnley or whatever it was in gimmick two, yeah. Uh, but yeah, we have a gimmick 18 now on the fixture ticker, and that comes with two blanks as well Brentford and uh, Man City because Man City are playing in the Club World Cup, um, and that has affected City, they are second bottom in terms of the fixture difficulty rating. Only their um, their fellow neighbors or their neighbors, Man United, even closer to the bottom uh, than them. But Brentford, on the other hand, have really good fixtures going up until Game Week 18 and also have some decent fixtures in Game Week 19 and 20. And we expect Game Week 20 to be a double Game Week <laughs> with the Man City-Brentford fixture being moved to Game Week 20. So um, we're going to get to Mbuemo for sure. He's like one of the main topics this, this week. Uh, but yeah, looking at the next few fixtures for Brentford, how confident you feel about him well you brought him in last week obviously um and this is probably the reason why like what do you expect from him in the next uh, few game weeks i'm expecting some goals i'm expecting some assists if, if fucking wissa does better than him <laughs> i'm deactivating my account <laughs> yeah, i mean that's fair no enough. but i i have pretty high expectations i think abuemo has been in the form of his um Premier League career in terms of this season because yeah. Ivan Tony hasn't been playing so and that's been beneficial for him. Yeah, he had this uh, sort of stint where he couldn't do anything and Brentford just generally speaking looked worse but they look like they're bouncing back and I think the teams are most importantly the, the thing that excited me about bringing him back. Luton at home, Brighton who have been up and down, Sheffield United who are crap, and Aston Villa who normally speaking aren't the best away from home. So yeah. a lot can happen, but I think Embuemo has looked great. He saw on penalties though. 
I reckon he'll be fine. Yeah, he's going to be a fantastic pick going forward. And yeah, even with the blank, I think you can manage that. Even with Hall and, and Buemo, you can just bench them in game week 18. <laughs> and hopefully I'll get enough bench for that. That's the thing with, for example, you with Gusto and Tavares. That's probably something yeah. you need to address before mm-hmm. that time comes. And also for me, um, you have Ariola at least two plays in game week 18. Uh, granted, it is against Man United, which where they might concede, but uh, but I have only Flecken as a goalkeeper, so I have to address that before game week 18 as well. But goalkeeper transfers don't really move me that much, so I'm gonna wait until uh, the final the final game week, uh, I think, to to do that transfer. Especially seeing as they have a good fixtures, I don't want to sell Flecken now uh, after keeping yeah. him for so long. Now that they play Luton and uh, Sheffield United, for example, where they are expected to keep clean sheets. Um, but yeah, uh, other than that, on this uh, history checker, anything that stand out, stands out to you in general? Are there any Nottingham Forest players, for example, that fans, uh, or tickles your fancy? Elanga, Gibbs White, for example? Uh, or are there just too many good midfielders for you to, to think about someone like that, for example? Unfortunately, it's just that, that there are just too many good players. And simply due to that is the reason why I'll avoid, but Elanga's look really fun so will i bring him in just just for the sake of it maybe it but it would require me to move around my team a bit too much and therefore i'm most likely not going to go with him but i do like the game against fulham wolves everton board but then even spurs i mean by by game week 17 we'll know how legit spurs are they might be in complete free fall by then so and if that's the case then yeah, Alanga looks good. Gibbs White looks good, and um, unfortunately, I would have obviously said uh, Awani, but he has a serious injury. So Chris Wood, uh, Chris Wood, four point nine, Chris Wood. <laughs> Let's move on to the next segment. Yes. <laughs> next up, we have the weekly local draft, which is something that I do okay. every week. Yeah. And uh, this week, it's a pretty similar team to what I had uh, last week, it's just, except for one major difference, and that is the fact that I have actually sold Saka. And granted, I did this before his like monster haul now in, <laughs> against Lance in the Champions League, which makes me second-guess some things. Maybe I shouldn't have him. But at the same time, we've talked a lot about Darwin and Isak, and that's why I have sold Saka, just to get room for Darwin and Isak, basically. Uh, mm-hmm. So they're both in the team. Also, just I quite like Suchek currently, with Antonio being out. I think he has... like. Uh, more license to go forward now and be in the box and be like that presence in the box that we lack without Antonio. So I think he's just like a nice um, eighth attacker, basically, who you can bench most weeks, but use in a pinch uh, for the most part. Also, Peter Poro comes in. I think he looked uh, fantastic in terms of offensive output, at least against Aston Villa. They're not going to keep that many clean sheets going forward, but Peter Poro is so good offensively that I think it makes up for it. I think it's sort of like Estepinan in that way that like even though they might not keep that many clean sheets, he's going to be involved in a lot of attacking stuff, and especially seeing as, he, as he's on set pieces as well. I really like him. Uh, yeah, Isak Suchek, uh, Pedro Poro, the goalkeepers also changed. Johnston has not performed well, and he has tougher fixtures, and now I have Ardraya in the squad as well, doubling up on the Arsenal defense. Um, so yeah, uh, that's pretty much the changes from last week for this team. Um, quite like it in general. It's kind of template, but it has some nice differential picks as well. Um, any thoughts for you when it comes to this team? Anything you would do differently? What do you think about the Saka being left out part as well? Um, what would you, you would, what would you do on a wild card? Do you think um, in general, if you had it now? The wild wild west. Uh, get rid of Saad for Saka yeah? for starters. I think so. Yeah, yeah, I think so. I, I think uh, Arsenal's matches are decent enough and yeah. shouldn't be ignored. So and also. He would save money with that as all yeah. and still be able to have Darwin and Isak, who uh, is too risky, but I'll do as a weekly wild card um, to have those three as the strikers. Um, but yeah, I, I think this is fun. I think Pedro Porro has been eye test king. My God, like yeah. uh, he's he's looked more enticing to me than Son. Yes, obviously he's super cheap. He, he's been cheaper in that regards, but also. I've liked what I've seen of Pedro Porro. Uh, I think he's, besides on the best two prospects you can get from them, obviously, uh, without excluding the injured players. Um, that being said, Lascelles, okay, yeah, fair, Branthwaite, fair. Suchek, interesting, fun. He's been scoring. 
He, yeah. He's looking back to the potato salad uh, days and that prospect we all had once upon a time. Definitely. Um, yeah, I think this is a fun, interesting sort of differentials with uh, Isak and... I don't know. Is Darwin like well picked? I I can't tell if he's not is really. I mean, he's still like quite a differential pick. So, so yeah, mm-hmm. I'd like to look. Yeah, I uh, I think uh, I like it. Raya's is definitely back in goal. Uh, a lot of people seem to have forgotten the reason why Raya didn't get to play against Brentford, which is the fact that he's <laughs> he was Don't loaned out. from Brentford. Yeah. And people are like, oh, what is this? Is Rams? Like I saw a bunch of tweets like, oh, is Ramsdale back on the menu? I was like. Jesus. Never. Anyways, um, no. I, it says everything that even in a game against Lons, uh, Ramsdale didn't get to play. It was Raya. So, yeah, uh, I like the team. I think there's a lot of differentials. The only thing is, it's a bit of a headache in terms of who you'd bench. I'm assuming you'd bench Suchek out of. Probably would be Suchek or Palmer potentially uh, in this upcoming game week. I think those yeah, guys fair. are like the, the main ones. But yeah, Suchek probably. Christopher Wells have been good defensively in the past at least. So, so it, it probably would be Suchek. But but yeah. Oh, well, yeah. like the team. I think um, <laughs> I think it's fair to get rid of Archer and Johnston, Reese James. But <laughs> yeah, Saka, right. Saka, Saka, Saka is the one that uh, yeah. I think uh, you're being racist about. So yeah. Yeah. It's it's just the fact that he's, he's yeah. faced Sheffield United and Burnley. Like you talk about the easy fixtures, he's had those easy fixtures now, he's, and he's, he's produced up in terms of like yeah. underlying numbers, produced just absolutely nothing. For some reason, he's like in scoring positions and getting goals and stuff in the Champions League, but in the league, he's just like basically just an assist man, and he's been doing really well at that. Gotten some fantastic yep. assists, Saka, because he has so much assets or so many facets, I should say, to his game. Uh, so yeah. yeah uh, Maybe I don't know. I just feel like Son is is like a higher potential player. I think he he has like more that twenty enough. point hole in him compared to Saka. Um, so yeah, I yes. just I just feel like I prefer Son over Saka currently. But that is like a huge topic of discussion now in FPL in general. So we fall in like on opposite sides of, sides of that spectrum, I, I guess. But, but yeah, I think that's uh, that's a fun part of FPL as well. Like we we don't always think the same. So. so yeah, I think that's a decent thing. I think if you have like for example, you have Saka, you don't have Son. I would probably not sell, try to sell Saka to get Son if I was in your shoes. But it, at the same time, if I was someone who had Son and not Saka, I would not do that either. I would not do Son to Saka. I would just stick with who I had, I guess, uh, between those two. And on the wall card, I think I just prefer Son. I have him as high as number five even uh, in the weekly wall card drafts because yeah, I just think he looks really le- lethal and he's going to score eventually. So, so yeah, I really like the look of Son in general. And I quite like the look of this team as well. I'm not tempted to use the wall card personally. I still have it in um, up my sleeve, I guess. Up my sleeve, I should say. Uh, but I'm going to use it in game week 19 for sure. Um, so yeah, pretty happy with the weekly wall card drafts. And if you want to hear all the thoughts about all the different players in the weekly wall card draft, you can check out the video I made on that earlier in this week as well. And the link will be both in the description. And yeah, if you just check out the channel, you'll find it. And yeah, subscribe for more if uh, if you're interested in that kind of stuff. And if you're one hour and 20 minutes into this podcast, uh, still listening, uh, then for sure subscribe. Uh, you've earned it at this point. Let's move on to your current plans, and uh, the plans are not really that much. You did mention potentially the really uh, out there move of doing Alvarez and Watkins to Darwin and Isak. And yes, I do have both Darwin and Isak in this team, but that is Darwin and Isak with the extra uh, four point hits or hits. I, I my voice cracks as I say that. Even <laughs> <laughs> um, I think it's I think it's a bit risky to do that as a four point hit, but. I personally would probably stamp out with this team. I think it looks really good for this game week. You probably need the transfers more in the future. But do you have any other thoughts? Any other players you, you wish to get rid of? Obviously, Gusto and Tavares, but you don't have the funds to get rid of them, I guess. Unless you want to get someone like Brantwaite, for example. But, um, but yeah, any any thoughts about the team in general and uh, your transfer plans? Uh, it's just very, 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 very sexy to have only one player uh, play away from home. That's yeah. uh, it's not very often you get a team that mostly consists of home players. So, yeah, feels good, man. Um, I think Stanley Pat seems like the most reasonable thing to do. 
I am just scared of Darwin. I am also scared of Isak. Watkins doesn't normally haul. He's the consistent sort of like seven, eight point apart from Brighton. sort of man. Uh, apart from Brighton, of course, and apart from Liverpool, that one uh, <laughs> crazy, was seven crazy game. Was. So in regards to that, that's the only thing that's maybe uh, interesting. Um, could I could I change anything else? Not really. I, th- I think Stanley Pat seems to be the most reasonable thing. Like I mentioned, 10 out of 11 players playing at home yeah. bodes well. The only difference that would be would be 11 players with uh, yeah. I mean, can, I mean, you, ha- you have that option. Or... I think by just looking at this team, I think the double move Alvarez and Watkins is probably too, too much with the minus four. But you yeah. could also just measure up Watkins versus Isak versus Darby Nunez. Who do you think is going to get the most points this game week? And is it worth the transfer from Watkins to one of those other guys? Because uh, yeah. obviously both Isak and and uh, Darwin play at home as well. So you actually get that dream fulfilled of having 11 players at home as well. If you do that. But for me, the reason that I'm leaning towards standing pad for your team is the fact that you don't really have all the information. It's going to be tough to to decide between those three. And maybe you buy Darwin and all of a sudden he's benched and Isak looks like a better prospect. Maybe you buy Isak and all of a sudden Watkins has like a huge game as well. I don't know. I think it's just like having that transfer in hand. It's just like a, an advantage, basically. If you had it as a free transfer, if you had two transfers and you just had to burn a transfer, I would definitely do it then. But since you only have one transfer and you want to get those two free transfers in the future, I probably would just stand pat. But I would also just think about it. Maybe if if we get confirmation that Darwin starts, I don't even know if that's a possibility this game week. Um, just looking back at the predictions, did they play on the early game? No, they play on the, the Sunday, obviously, because they have the uh, Europa League. Um, but yeah, um, if I had any indication that he would start, maybe I would do do that. But again, mm-hmm. let's look at Newcastle. Do you have any... Newcastle, ah, that's a bit too late. I don't think... I, mean, I assume Isaac starts that game, but... And I assume Darwin starts the game against uh, Fulham as well, but you never really know. But, but yeah, I would probably just like, if I was making any decisions with your team, it would probably be that. Do I want to do Watkins to either Isak or, or Darwin? And then just like go with whatever feels right for you. But I think just having the advantage of having the extra information no. that one, week gave, one game gives you and also just uh, just yeah, getting the extra transfer is, is value in and of itself. But, but yeah. No, 100%. I also think that Dula Alvarez is back in goal-scoring ways, and Watkins, of course, scored against Spurs, so it's not the worst. <clears throat> and considering the fact that had I just stood Pat a week ago, yeah. I would have gotten a 13-point haul from Mr. Anthony Gordon himself. So there, there is merit to standing Pat, and I feel that I will most likely stand Pat However, if I'm feeling a little bit risky, which I sometimes do, <laughs> Darwin Isak aren't the worst players yeah. to bring in. Yeah, especially for sure. because I'm not considering just this game. I'm considering long term. Yeah, and getting sure. rid of Alvarez, who is a city player, who will eventually be on the blank for a player who isn't in either one of those players, and Darwin, who has easier games. And has one of the best schedules going forward, and Aston Villa, who have a decreasing um, sort of um, like or not as flattering schedule, that also makes sense. However, I could just wait a week to do so. Yeah, I mean, I think personally, if I had to do a transfer for you, um, and in the forward department, as we have talked about, it ha- it would have to be Watkins because you can't afford Isak or. Uh, or Darwin just uh, from selling Alvarez, sadly. Like, if you had enough money for that, I think that would be your move this, this game week, just Alvarez to, to one of those guys, because Alvarez hasn't looked yeah. as impressive lately. Uh, and they also have, on paper at least, like the tougher fixture in terms of uh, playing Spurs, even though it is at home, to be fair. Yeah. Uh, but if I were first, if I was forced to do a move, ah, it's really close between Isak or Dar- Darwin, to be honest. But I don't know, especially after seeing Man United conceding three goals in that fashion against Galatasaray. And seeing how Isak has scored in the, the last two game weeks, 
it feels just too good to be true, really. And especially seeing as you already have Salah from from the Liverpool game, and you want Salah to get all the goals because you're captaining him. Mm-hmm. I'd probably go with Watkins to Isak potentially, but I, I could also see Watkins to 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 Darwin as well, or just the standing pat with Watkins. It's really tough, but uh, but yeah, uh, standing pat is usually usually a good idea. It always feels like it, I think it's like a natural bias for humans to feel like I have to do something, so I need to to do the change, but. That is also something that could leave, leave you astray. Like I've experienced a couple of times this season where I've done transfers and then the trans- tra- player that I transferred out ended up scoring way more than the player that I transferred in. So, so yeah. Uh, but yeah, that's pretty basically your team. Let's move on to Kimo's current plans. And uh, he has also some other plans. He is actually really sold on Isak and really wants him. And he does have two free transfers, uh, which uh, helps him a lot in that regard. So his plan is uh, doing um, Diaby to Palmer. Selling Diaby before the Bournemouth game, I think selling Diaby is much more viable than, than Watkins, especially seeing Diaby was subbed off at the half last time. Maybe it doesn't even start, and Watkins has just looked like a better player than Diaby the last few game weeks, so I think that's a, a pretty big difference there. Uh, and selling Diaby to, Paul, to Palmer gives him enough funds to do Alvarez to Isak, because he's really high on Isak, uh, as we all are, basically, uh, for this upcoming game week. The one thing about this team, though, is the fact that he doesn't have Embuemo, so that's the other thing he has to to think about. Maybe he wants to sell Diaby to get Embuemo. He doesn't have the money to do that straight up, but he could do that uh, by funding it in a different way, for example, by selling cash. So I think my suggestion for Kimo before he came with his own suggestion was doing Diaby to Embuemo, and the way you get that is basically just go all out on West Ham. <laughs> you already have three West Ham players, but you can get a de facto West Ham player in Craig Dawson. Uh, for uh, for Wolverhampton, he has a really. If you look at the the fixture for them, they have a really tough fixture now against Arsenal away. But he doesn't need a defender this fixture because he has well, to be fair, Aguirre against the Palace. But he has Chimikas and, and Trippier, which are, are decent uh, players. And Aguirre, I think, it's a decent player. He plays at home at least against a team that yeah. doesn't have Eze. So I think his defense is fine. And then Good he can, score. Yeah, and then he can have uh, for the next few game weeks Burnley at home, Nottingham Forest at home. Uh, really decent fixtures there for for Dawson, so I think that would probably be my 4.5 defender of choice. Also, just because of the memes, because of the the West Ham thing, because he was already tripled up. So loading up on former West Ham players is also the next step, I think, in in the chemo evolution, I guess. But but yeah, so basically between the two options, getting Isak um, or Embuemo, well, that's pretty much like the the discussion there for chemo. What he's going to have to think about. If you had to have only one player for the next five game weeks, Isak or Mbemo, who would it be and why? I think in terms of consistency and availability being the best ability, you have to go with Mbemo. Yeah. Even though <clears throat> Isak is a million times the player Mbemo is, motherfuck. Um, <laughs> it's also the fixtures. It's also it's it's just a mixture of everything, right? Like, I think Mbemo... Ha- is the better prospect simply because they have the better fixtures as well. So it also, um, but I get it. I think he's also tired of having both Holland and um, Julian Alvarez, which makes sense. So yeah. 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 Uh, the only thing with the fixtures though is the game 18 fixture, obviously where Brentford blank and, um, Yes, he's like, he's like plays against Luton of all teams as well. Um, yes. So that's like the difference when it comes to that. But when it comes to his team, uh, Mubama's not going to play. Lamptey's not going to play. He's out for a long while. Um, yeah. So so maybe he's more pressed in that regard that he needs players to play every game week, even game week 18. So, so maybe that's why Isak like, might be a better option for him. But, but yeah, I would not be too happy about going without Mbuemo. He could also do the other thing. It's because we talked about potentially selling Son in this uh, podcast. You could do Son to Mbemo and have that fund Alvarez to Isak as well. So you could go yep. with both as well. Yeah. Is that probably what Is you would do? Or yeah, I, 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 it all depends on wh- how much he values Son. Yeah, He's because I don't think I, I don't think Diaby against Bournemouth is the worst play in that regards, right? Yeah, like he could wait a week to sell. Could do that. Um, uh, Diaby, so Son, yeah, Son to, yeah, that could be interesting. I so think that, that, that could be the way Alvarez to uh, to Isak, and that gives him uh, more than enough money in the bank as well, because Alvarez and Isak is not that much of a difference. Yeah. Son to Mbemo is a big difference, so he has enough money to upgrade Diaby if he wants to as well. 
yeah. uh, if there even are like a, a more expensive midfielder to get currently. But or you could upgrade Ducoria to someone more expensive as well, potentially. Yeah. Um, so that leaves him with some options. P- potentially even Mubama up to someone like Solanke, for example. Like, or get get the king himself guarded, but <laughs> yeah, don't do, don't do that. That would hurt my feelings. <laughs> Anyways. So yeah, he, had, he does have some different options, but uh, obviously he captained Son last game week, so I think he is pretty... <laughs> yeah, he's pretty optimistic he when it comes to Son, uh, and he's been uh, like before the season even start even started. He said that he thinks Spurs are going to be like the the major like surprise of the season, and so far he's been right. Yep. And so far he's been doing well in FPL as well. So it'll be interesting to see what Kimo does with his own team. Uh, hopefully it's better than uh, getting acquired last game week. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Pretty much. Uh, even though I, I love uh, I, obviously Aguero is a West Ham player, I, I need to back him, but at the same time, kind of mistake prone as well. He's kind of. Loki uh, had has done uh, quite a few big mistakes for us then, but either way. Uh, let's move on to the next team, which is the manager of the week, Gary Carter. And this is his team going into game 14. Again, I think it looks really good. The thing is, though, two free transfers. You don't want to burn a transfer. And I think the main transfer for me, I think, um, just looking at the team, I think Chemikas is still a good option, uh, seeing as he's going to play for the next few game weeks. Uh, Mark Gahey, though, on the other hand, um, not so much, perhaps. They have tougher fixtures. Don't really know about him in general. Uh, so getting Chimikas in for Gahey and then benching Taylor, probably, against Sheffield United. Seems like a sensible move. You could also do cash to Pedro Poro, like we mentioned Poro earlier. Like He's uh, a good player, but probably not this game week, playing as Man City away. Probably not the game week to bring in Poro, but I think that's something in the future, at least, he can can think about. And then also, he could do the same thing as you, Gordon to Palmer, just a week later, now that he has the 13 points from Gordon. Uh, he could do that as well, but I think Goye to Chimikas is basically what I would do uh, if I was in this position. You also have yep. the goalkeepers potentially selling Ariola and getting someone like Raya, for example, uh, could be the play. Maybe yep. potentially cash to Chimikas and, uh, and Ariola to Raya. I think he has enough money to do that as well, so he could do that, something like that, for example. You could also do the same thing that we mentioned now with Watkins down to either Isak or Darwin if he feels like that as well. So a lot of options, two free transfers, 0.6 in the bank, and just a really good solid team in general with several players that are going to play at least in game 18. So uh, so yeah, what are your thoughts about this team uh, in terms of what uh, Gary Carter should do for this upcoming game week with all the free transfers and uh, players that he has? Yeah, as um, a Simicast owner, I think... It's not the biggest sideways move to bring him in, especially for Mark Gay. And, you know, we know that he can get assists, even lucky ones. So, yeah, I would, uh, I'd think Simica's in. And if he's sort of unsure about what to do next, yeah, to save the transfer. I think, I think the triple up of Liverpool players isn't the dumbest thing. So if he did get Watkins out for uh, potentially um, Darwin Nunez, but, yeah, I think the the best thing he could do right now is for sure. I think Simicus is the guaranteed transfer to do. Okay. And then decide whether you want to do the second one or just save it. Because if you save it, great. You know, then you you've got two transfers again. So yeah, I think I think Simicusin is the one he should do as the priority. Yeah. I mean I think so too. That's the the first transfer that I listed. I'm kind of in two minds if I would sell Cash or Guehi as well because obviously Cash is benched in this team and just on the topic of that as well would you bench Cash or would you play him over Taylor Taylor plays Sheffield United that's basically why I've started him because Sheffield United are just god awful but yeah I would bench probably Lascelles or Taylor it's one or the other oh, well, I, yeah I, you didn't even think about him yeah because um, I think Man United will score in that game yeah um, potentially I had 3-0 and Les- <laughs> yeah I know and <laughs> Lascelles isn't notoriously known for scoring either, even though he did against Chelsea. So I would probably, if Cash is going to explode in one of these games, it's got to be a game where he plays right wing, right? Yeah, most likely. But we'll see what happens now. He had a pretty terrible game last uh, last time around. And also tackled Bentaker and injured him as well, which is bad karma as well. So Yep, 100%. So yeah, um, on that note, uh, let's uh, speak of karma and uh, speaking to the Buddhist, Kevin, um, I'll leave you as always with the final word. Or before I do that, again, I just have to mention the Manager of the Week thing. You can join the Mini League, V9JT0D. Uh, but either way, 
that's it for this podcast and as always i leave the final word to kevin my favorite buddhist friend uh what do you have to say to end this podcast the first time that i've blanked on what i wanted to say <laughs> uh let me, put it this, let me put it this oh okay you should berate <laughs> someone that always gives me ideas uh you know what i'm gonna leave it on a positive note because it's been a positive week and I've got a lot of fun things happening this weekend. I'm going to wish everyone good luck on their FPL game week, except anyone who's above me, which is like 1.1 million players. So fuck all of you. Take care.